inner ear. You know, we've talked about in lab a bit that your ear is not just about hearing. So this is going to be, you know, hearing, obviously, which is basically air vibrations, which are tickling your eardrum. Um, but then there's also other parts in the hearing. We're going to see this is going to be the part of the inner ear called the cochlea. Then we're going to have these equilibrium senses, equilibrium or balance. And there's going to be two kind of sub branches of that. There's going to be like dynamic, which is also called rotational equilibrium, which way is your head spinning? And that's going to be the semicircular canals. And there's three of them. Basically, you can tell if your head is turning in a horizontal plane, if you're dipping up and down like yes, 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 or if you're rolling back and forth like that. So we'll see three semicircular canals. That'll be this dy dynamic or rotational equilibrium. And then the other kind of equilibrium we call st static equilibrium. And this is basically, it's also called, this is basically like, you know, which way is gravity pulling? And this is going to be the utricle and the saccule. So these are also in the inner ear, the semicircular canals, the utricle and the saccule doing equilibrium. And so we'll look at these as well as hearing with the cochlea. Um, at the core of all of this is going to obviously there has to be some kind of transduction, some conversion of either like vibrations or rotations into some electrical signal. And that's going to be done with a special cell called the hair cell. So whether we're whether we're looking at hearing or equilibrium, at the core of it all is going to be the hair cell. So let me introduce mm -hmm. your friend and mine, the hair cell. All right, so hair cell, it's, it's a single cell. It's called a hair cell because it has these extensions of its membrane up. They're actually mostly stereocilia, which are basically like overgrown microvilli. Although there's one true cilium and they call it the kinocilium. It's the tallest one. And it's worth paying attention to this one because it's going to orient us to how this depolarizes or hyperpolarizes when you bend it. Um, and so this whole hair bundle here you can bend it this way. If you bend it towards the kinocelium, the it'll increase the VM of the cell. If you bend it away from the kinocelium, it's going to decrease the voltage of the of the cell. So this is basically a mechanotransducer, right? It's transforming mechanical movement into a voltage change. You know, and as the voltage goes up and down on this hair cell, it's going to change the frequency of like action potentials that end up getting triggered going down the axon going off to where it's, you know, the vestibular cochlear nerve telling the brain about hearing and equilibrium. So this is a, is going to be at the core to understand either balance or understand hearing. This little dude, yeah, it's kind of like mm -hmm. Bart Simpson looking guy. Don't have a cow, man. I'm just here doing mechanotransduction. Um, so now we can go to the 
PowerPoint. So this should look familiar. This is just the end. This is the ear with the outer ear, which is basically your pinna. Um, the middle ear we talked about being that little place with the little bones connecting. So let me get my little pointer here, my highlighter, give it a good color, How about green. The middle ear here, this was where you have those little ossicles, those little bones that will help efficiently transfer the vibrations, right? That sound is coming in, air vibrations coming in, make the eardrum, the tympanic membrane um, vibrate back and forth. Then these three little bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, also known as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, can then push and pull and there are little membranes here. This one called the oval window is basically a little membrane where you can push and pull. This is the little fluid filled inner ear. So because you need the vibration in this fluid environment, Whoa, hold on. I need to quick little thing over here. All right, I think we're good. Um, so fluid filled environment of the inner ear here. The role of these little ossicles is to efficiently transfer that vibration in there. Um, we'll talk about the inner ear in just a few moments in lots of detail. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the middle ear before we get there. Um, one thing about the middle ear is because it's filled with air and it's air outside here, and then you've got this tympanic membrane, the eardrum. If you don't have equal pressure on both sides of the eardrum, the eardrum is going to either want to explode outward or implode inwards, right? So you need to balance the pressure on either side of the eardrum. And that can be a problem, like, right? You can have, let's say it's just air pressure, sea level here in your middle ear, and then you start, you know, going up a mountain, you start driving up to Tahoe or something, and the pressure outside becomes less and less. So then you start getting more and more pressure building up inside the ear, boom, boom, and you're gonna end up exploding your eardrum. And so you need some way to equalize the pressure in the middle ear with the air pressure outside. And that's gonna be this little dude, the eustachian tube, right? So, and it's just, you know, pharynx, it's the your back of your throat, this is just, a little opening, a little tunnel that goes down to the back of your throat and allows the air pressure in the middle ear to equalize with whatever pressure is in the room. Um, normally, this eustachian tube is kind of flopped shut, but it opens like when you yawn or you swallow and it allows, in fact, everybody should, I'd like everybody to do this. Like if it's called the Valsalva maneuver, if you hold your nose and you blow, that's gonna shove air up the eustachian tube, up into the middle ear, and you'll feel your eardrum pooch out. Uh, don't, don't do it so hard that you explode your eardrum, but if you blow, everybody should do that. And you'll, you should feel your eardrums all of a sudden push out. And then when you swallow, it'll get let the um, pressure re equalize again, everything should be back to normal. Um, if you've got a cold, it can be, um, it can be tricky to equalize the pressure because things are inflamed. It's like, you know, if you have a cold, you're not allowed to go, you know, diving because 
in order to make sure you don't implode your eardrums as the pressure builds up as you go deep underwater, you have to do that Valsalva maneuver and blow the air up into the middle ear to equalize the pressure with the water pressure that's building up. Um, what else about this? I should also, if did anybody feel anything weird with your, um, in your eyes when you did the Valsalva maneuver? No? A lot of times you'll feel something weird right on the inside of your eye. There's another tunnel from your nasal cavity to where your tear, tears drain, your tears drain into your nasal cavity as well. So by doing the Valsalva maneuver, you can actually blow bubbles out your eyes if you're in a pool. It's just a cool little party trick if you are trying to geek somebody out. Um, okay. So middle ear, you know, if you have some kind of an ear infection, that can make it hard to hear because obviously it's going to make the vibration not work properly. Um, I should also mention you have a couple of little muscles that help protect you from damaging your inner ear if there's really loud sounds, right? Because these little bones are responsible for transmitting the vibration from the from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. So if the sounds are really loud, there's two little muscles. Um, there's one called the tensor tympanum and one called stapedius that actually tighten up these little muscle, these muscles tighten up the bones so they don't move as well. So it keeps that energy from getting delivered to the inner ear and protects the delicate hair cells from getting damaged if the sounds are really loud. Um, during REM sleep, I don't know if you remember, I kind of had a little aside, like basically during REM, your muscles are basically paralyzed, except for your eye muscles and these little inner ear muscles. So those little inner ear muscles actually can wiggle around a little bit while you're in REM as well. Um, not that you're gonna notice them, but so, and I, maybe I should, like the names, Tensor tympanum kind of makes sense. It kind of tightens up near the tympanic membrane. It keeps the keeps the eardrum from vibrating as much. And stapedius is another little muscle that is tightening up on the other end of the chain. You know, st the stapes is the little stirrup bone that's wiggling the little oval window of the membrane leading into the inner ear. Um, all right, so um, All right, so the middle ear has the three little bones and the eustachian tube going down. Again, all of this is located within the skull. Temporal bone of the skull, right? We saw that in in our lab that's why bone conduction works when you wiggle when you vibrate the bone you're vibrating the whole ear so that's why the little inner ear the cochlea the hair cells are vibrating when you stick that tuning fork on the skull um all right so pinna we're not going to talk much about our pinna just kind of sit there they do a little bit but 
Um, middle ear, we've just been talking about transmit the vibration into the fluid um, world of the inner ear. Also has the ability to um, attenuate, to diminish the transmission if you're trying to protect the inner ear from super loud sounds. So now we're going to focus on the inner ear. It's got this one part called the cochlea. Cochlea means Latin for snail because it spirals around two and a half times, looks kind of like a snail shell. Although it's about half the it's about the size, half the size of a split pea. It's dinky, but it's it's pretty cool. Um, this other part of the inner ear is called the vestibule. Um, vestibule. This is where we find the utricle and the saccule, those things that I talked about that are going to be important for the static equilibrium, sensing the direction of gravity. So the vestibule is going to have the saccule and the utricle are going to be sitting here in the vestibule. Um, and the semicircular canals, there's three of them, and they're sitting basically coming off of the vestibule, kind of like little Mickey Mouse ears. You know, even though the semicircular canals aren't officially part of the vestibule, um, because they kind of come right off it and they're also involved in equilibrium, um, people often just will say vestibular senses. It's usually kind of a equivalent to saying equilibrium senses. So the vestibular senses, again, saccule in the utricle for the static equilibrium direction of gravity, semicircular canals, which are telling you which way is your head rotating, the rotational acceleration or dynamic equilibrium. And we'll look at those in more detail in just a few moments. Um, and then the cochlea, which is doing the hearing, the vibration from the little bones is going to be vibrating a little membrane right here called the oval window. That's basically where you push and pull to get the vibration into the inner ear. Um, because fluid is not compressible, you need to have another little window that can adjust. Like if you push in, something has to pooch out. So there's going to be another little window right next to it. A window, another little membrane called the round window. that basically does the opposite of whatever. If the oval window is pushing in, the round window has to pooch out. If the round oval window is pulling out, then the round window has to pull in. So it's basically, it just adjusts, you know, compensates for whatever the oval window is doing since the fluid is not compressible, right? If you just tried to push on a fluid, it wouldn't move. You wouldn't be able to make a vibration enter in. So, if you push into this, this will pooch out a little bit. That makes sense. Um, all right, let's look. Okay, we're doing okay here. Let's let's start with these guys. Let's start with the saccule and the utricle. Then we'll get to the semicircular canals. Then we'll finish up with the cochlea. Um, I wonder. see. Yeah, I'll just show you right here. I'm going to go share. All right, so this is, again, that inner ear. This here is that vestibule where I said the saccule and the utricle are. Um, both the saccule and the utricle are the same basic 
organ just at like kind of 90 degree angles. Kind of the way you have three semicircular canals to tell different um, different axes. The saccule and the utricle. So we're going to be looking at the saccule and the utricle right now. It's basically going to be a bed of hair cells. So hair cells, and we know hair cells will bend if, or if they bend, they change their voltage. And then there is these things called the otoliths on top, which are basically little calcium carbonate crystals. Otolith means ear stones. So we have basically a big bag of rocks sitting on top of these hair cells. You know, rocks that are heavy enough that they are going to be influenced by gravity as you move your head one direction or another. So here we have our dude here. And if he's just got his head this way, the little rocks are sitting on top of the hair bundles. Here he's tilting his head back. And now since it's changed the orientation, the little otoliths, the little crystals, the little ear stones are going to be pulling down. They're going to bend the little hair bundle. As the hair bundle bends, it creates an action potential, goes to his brain, saying gravity is now pulling from a different orientation with respect to my head. So that, does that make sense? If he, if he tilted his head the other way, then they would go the other way. The hair bundles would bend the opposite direction and the voltage change would be the opposite. So you get information that now you're tilting your head in the opposite direction with respect to gravity. So that's all the saccule and the utricle do. They are in there. Um, they are just always telling you which direction is gravity pulling with respect to your head. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Now we'll go to the semicircular canals. So in each of these semicircular canals, There's this kind of bump, this is called the ampulla, the swelling. And in there, again, you've got hair cells. Hair cells, and you know, if this is the semicircular canal, here's this ampulla, this kind of bump. And then you've got these hair cells. And then you have this called a cupula, this kind of gelatinous thing. And this is all filled with fluid, this endolymph. And again, I'm not, there's so much we could talk about endolymph and perilymph and things we're not going to. Let's just leave it that this is filled with fluid. Again, this is something we already talked about in lab. And as you spin your head in one direction or another, you're gonna have the inertia of this fluid it's going to push on the cupula, on this little gelatinous thing. It's going to bend the hair cells. And that's going to send an electrical signal to your brain saying, my head's rotating. You know, and you've got three orientations because there's, again, if you were, I'm a little airplane, I can do my pitching, my yawing, or my rolling. You know, depending on which of those three axes your head is moving, one or the other one of these, Semicircular canals will have this whole story with the bending hair cells sending a message to your brain saying, my head is rotating in this or that direction. So, you know, I could go deeper into this, but I'm thinking you've seen this already. So this should feel relatively familiar. Yeah, I do, I do acknowledge that my drawing using my mouse and this Highlighter is pretty stinky, so hopefully it makes sense to y'all. Sorry, so when we move, the fluid moves and it pushes on the cupula, which moves the hair cells? 
It's more the fluid doesn't move. Okay. Um, in, like if this is, let's say this is the little thing in there in your inner ear. And then there's that fluid in there. And then there's the little hair cells in here. So as you rotate your head around one way or another, this fluid basically stays still. And this is pushing one way or the other direction against that fluid, which is now going to push it and bend it. So kind of like, um, like I, I did, I kind of showed this in when we did the lab. Like if I have a piece of paper and I think of the, oh, I need to turn off my squirrel. Hold on. If I have a piece of paper like this, and again, air is a fluid. It's more invisible, but it's it's a fluid, right? You can feel it. You can move it around. It, you know, it blows into sails, moves a boat across the ocean. Um, so there's this fluid which isn't moving, but I'm moving this thing, which would be like the cupola. And if I move it in one direction or another direction, it's going to bend backwards as it is feeling resistance from this fluid that has the inertia. So as you move your head around, the fluid is staying still, like the air is staying still. The cupula is moving with your head, like I'm moving this paper. It bends as it bends. Mm -hmm. The hair cells um, bend, create voltage changes, and that's how your brain knows that you are rotating your head. Um, okay, dokie. And sometimes they call this rotational acceleration because it's like, what is the acceleration of the rotation of your head? Sometimes they call it dynamic equilibrium because it's about how is your head moving, dynamic, as opposed to static equilibrium, like I'm not moving at all, but which direction is gravity pulling? So static equilibrium is kind of the direction of gravity. Dynamic equilibrium is which way is my head rotating right now. Um, all right, which leaves us finally to hearing in the cochlea, which, again, we could spend a half a day on this, but we're not. You know, this is always kind of a little frustrating. I, I spent a lot of my life studying the ear, so there's lots of fun things to talk about on it. But we're going to do the ear in a nutshell. Let's go share screen. Oh. All right. So the cochlea. So again, the air vibrations coming in, vibrates the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. That vibration is transmitted by the ossicles, the little bones, into the oval window. That oval window then starts these pressure waves that go and spiral up the cochlea. And this cochlea spirals around like two and a half times. It's way easier to think about the cochlea if you unwrap it. So imagine you take this spiral and you unwrap it. So this thing that looks kind of like a leech here or whatever, this is, this is like the base of the, um, here's the round window here. Here's the base of this thing. And it's, it's assuming you're just unwrapping it and straightening it all out. So the very tip of the snail here, the tip of the snail is this thing, the helicotrema. This is the apex of the snail. Um, so I am not going to go into all of the details of, you know, the bony labyrinth and membranous labyrinth because we don't have the time and the perilymph and endolymph. 
Instead, let's just say that you end up, because of the anatomy of this thing, you get three main ducts, three main tunnels that go up the snail. In fact, you can see if this is like a cross section of the snail, there's this upper, upper um, duct, this middle duct where the actual hair cells are, and this lower duct. So when you first have the sound enter, it goes in what's called the vestibular duct. So here is where the sound is entering into the fluid of the inner ear. It goes up to the helicotrema, in which case it comes back down the other way. And then we talked about the round window is where the pressure is released. So here we see that pressure wave now that used to be in the air is now in this fluid going up this, temp this vestibular duct, looping around the helicotrema, coming back down out the round window. Um, and then obviously we need to have hair cells involved or else we don't have the transduction. So inside this cochlear duct, there are hair cells in here. So if you look, this is that middle duct here, this cochlear duct. Inside there, there is this thing called the organ of corti. The spiral organ of corti. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the whole thing with the eponyms is kind of an interesting thing, you know, particularly, particularly like with all the latest things about kind of, you know, because a lot of these things are named after these anatomists or physiologists who first described them in the literature, you know, but, you know, getting your name out into the literature was usually, you know, it's, it's kind of a classic, you know, white male people who had access to actually get things out there. So they've been trying more and more to kind of get away from using a lot of the eponyms mm. just because they provide a kind of distorted view of like who discovered all the cool stuff about the world. Um, you know, I mean, you've probably known about like Rosalind Franklin, the, the like woman who was instrumental in figuring out the structure of DNA, but never didn't get much credit at all because she wasn't even allowed in the libraries at the universities because she was a woman. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of yeah. If you go back historically, it's it's pretty it's pretty shameful looking at how it all unfolded. Um, so spiral organ of Corti, though we still we still call it the organ of Corti. Um, this has hair cells and it's sitting here on what's called the basilar membrane so this thing that's kind of purple let me kind of change my pointer here i'm gonna get my pointer and i'm gonna maybe i'll use how about green this thing that i'm highlighting in green here that's the basilar membrane. That's where the organ of Corti is on. The so organ of Corti is on this basilar membrane. So this vibration that is going up and down is obviously shaking the basilar membrane and the hair cells are on the basilar membrane. So the hair cells are jiggling, which means as the hair cells jiggle there, they are going to create voltage changes that go sent out the cochlear nerve to the brain. So like if I here's my cochlear duct. Here's my tympanic duct. No, duh, my vestibular duct. My tympanic duct. Um, here's the stapes from the little ear bones, ossicles. 
Um, here's the Gila Katrima. Let me, so hold on, let me rewrite that. Gila Katrima. Here is this basilar membrane. Here is all the organ of Corti with the hair cells. They're basically hair cells with a little, it's called the tectorial membrane sitting on top of them. And the last piece of information we need to make this work is that the basilar membrane is mechanically tuned. So hold on one sec. Like a guitar, like depending on the physical, physical, like mechanical properties of something, it has a frequency it likes to vibrate at. Like if I pluck the low E string, you know, that's what it likes to vibrate at. You just excite it and that's what it does. The I high E string, you pluck it and it just vibrates at a very different pitch. The, Which, which string you pluck based on its weight and its thickness and its mechanical properties, it has what's called a resonant frequency, a frequency that it naturally vibrates at due to its just physical nature. Um, the basilar membrane has different properties as you go along it. The basilar membrane vibrates at low frequencies out near the helicotrema and high frequencies when you get closer to where the um, round and oval window are. Just based on its, its physical properties, right? Just like those strings, you know, so this is basically like this, this part here is more got the properties of like that higher, the string that vibrates and absorbs energy at a higher frequency. The far end here near the helicotrema, near the tip apex of the snail, absorbs and vibrates at lower frequency. So what that means now is we can just finish our story is the sound is coming in into your ear. Obviously, it has to get to the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. Let's just call it eardrum because it'll be easier to write. You know, the eardrum then is connected to these bones which push and pull on this oval window and start the vibration in the fluid world here. And depending on the frequency of that vibration, the basilar membrane is going to absorb that energy and shake. So if it's a low frequency, it's going to happen up here. And the hair cells in the organ of Corti up here are going to vibrate. And the brain knows it's a lower frequency because it's getting a message from the hair cells that live on the low frequency part of the basilar membrane. High frequency is going to vibrate up here. Right, so if it's a high frequency, this part of the basilar membrane is going to absorb and vibrate. The hair cells over here are going to get excited and send a message saying it's a high pitch sound. So d d does that make sense? So we have this tonotopy mapping of frequency along from the high frequency at this part to low frequencies at the far end of the of the cochlea. This is all in the cochlea. You know, I should say unwound co cochlea because an actual cochlea is like a snail, right? An actual cochlea would be one, two and a half, be like that. So is, is that making sense? Yes, no? 
Um, holy crap. Okay, the other thing I'll just mention while we're here. Not all the hair cells are sensory. I've been talking about the hair cells as converting motion into electrical signals for the brain. It turns out that the most important hair cells that we talk about are what are called the inner hair cells that are doing that. But the organ of Corti also has what are called outer hair cells that actually do the opposite transduction. There are actually efferents that control the cochlea as well. What, what does efferent mean? Efferent nerves. They're traveling away from the CNS? Yeah, exactly. And they're controlling motor stuff. So you actually have signals that go into the cochlea that talk to this other family of hair cells that do the opposite transduction. You electrically excite them and then they move, right? Instead of moving to create an electrical signal, you excite them with an electrical signal and they move and they push and pull on the membranes in there and they can actually change the tuning properties of the inner ear. Um, it's kind of like an interesting story. What happened was, um, you know, I'm talking about how the resonant frequency of the basilar membrane can tell the brain what frequency you've got, right? I said, if it's, if the part that vibrates at low frequencies is vibrating up here, we know it's a low frequency. If it's vibrating down here, we know it's absorbing on this part. It's got to be a high frequency. It turns out that a pure resonance like that, even though it can tell you what frequency is happening, it doesn't really tell you much about the timing information, right? If I have one of these strings and I pluck it, it'll actually, you know, it'll absorb at a certain frequency and start going, but then it has trouble stopping. It just keeps going. So you kind of get lost. Like, when did it really start? When did it stop? Um, so when people started looking at the ear, they realized that there had to be something more going on, that the actual functioning, the tuning properties of the ear are much more complicated than just a simple mechanical resonance. And they realized there had to be these active components. And they, that's when they started looking and found like these hair cells that actually go in and physically change the mechanical properties in there and help preserve both Frequency information, you want to be able to tell what's the frequency information. Is it high, low frequency? But you also want to be able to tell when did it start? When did it stop? So the actual, again, I'm not going to go into it, but there's all sorts of cool things we could talk about with how the ear preserves both timing information and frequency information and why that's so important, how that helps you, your ears make sure that you don't get eaten by a tiger when you're like kind of walking in the jungle. Um, two last things I'll mention. One is cochlear implants. Um, because there is this tonotopy in the inner ear, right? There's just this mapping in general of low frequency starting, I mean, high frequency here, going to low frequency, getting up to here. If for whatever reason that ear isn't working, but the basic neurons are still intact that supply here. You can just put a little array of electrodes. So a cochlear implant is sticking an array of electrodes up into the cochlear duct. You have little electrodes along the way. So you can stimulate it anywhere you want. And then you've got some little electronic thing, like a microphone listening to the sounds. It calculates what is the frequency composition of the sound and will stimulate the little electrodes in here uh, appropriately um, to send information about the frequency composition of the sounds that are coming in. So that's what a cochlear implant is. It's actually a little array of electrodes that goes up your cochlea and then will give little jolts of electricity appropriately to the proper part of the cochlea, depending on what frequencies um, its little electronic microphone is detecting. 
So does, does that make sense? You know, it's obviously not going to be as good as having a real ear, but it can give you more, inf a lot more information than you had otherwise. And people who get it really young can actually rewire their, because it, kids are way more plastic in terms of their, their brains than adults. Um, kids who get it really early can actually get pretty good hearing with this kind of thing. Um, although then there's a whole big ethical thing around, um, yeah, this, yeah, we can't, you know, got to go. There's a whole thing around deaf community versus hearing and like, why not, you know, there's, cause there's some people get, you know, it's like, do you want to be a, a kind of impaired version of a hearing person or a fully embedded version of a deaf person in the deaf community? So it's, it can get really, it can get a really kind of tricky. It's not quite as obvious and clear as you might think about why you would or wouldn't want to get this kind of surgery. Um, finally, just to kind of make sure, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention one more time. Part of the reason I think hearing is just so kind of crazy is, you know, when you look around, if you're using your eyes, you've got a whole bunch of little photo detectors on the back of your eyes. So if I'm looking at a, a dog or something, it looks like a fox. You know, the fox is going to land on some photoreceptors which go to your brain, and then the tree next to the fox land on some other photoreceptors which go to your brain. So it's not that shocking that you're able to pick out, oh, there's the fox amongst the trees, right? Hearing is really, really different. Hearing, you've got this fox is going, oh, 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 or they go, they go, yip, yip, yip. You know, and the tree is blowing in the wind. And there's like a little bird on the tree going chirp, 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 chirp. chirp. You know, all of that is getting added together. There is one eardrum, like assuming it's, yeah, let's just talk about one ear right now. One eardrum moving back and forth in some sum total of all the vibrations that are coming in to make that big mess of vibration. And yet somehow you actually do pull apart the different elements. You don't have that much trouble hearing, oh yeah, there's a bird singing and the rustling of the leaves and the little coyote barking or something or fox barking, I should say, right? So that's, it's, you know, that's part of, you know, it goes back into that discussion I was talking about just a few moments ago why it's really important to be able to preserve the timing information, the frequency information. The, all of that gives your brain the information it needs to try to deconstruct what elements actually came together to make this thing so we can kind of try to figure out what's actually out there in the world rather than just hearing some crazy noise. So, yeah, I mean, when you think about the ears, what they're doing and how they call it like the cocktail party effect. Like you're at a cocktail party and you hear different people talking and glasses clinking and the music of the, you know, the stereo playing, you know, it's all one big glom signal vibrating your eardrum. And yet, you know, you can make out all these auditory objects, which is, which is pretty amazing. It's impressive. I think. Um, so blah, blah, blah. Any, I think where I'm going to leave it there. There's, it's hard to not talk about the ear. Um,